we need to have a paradigm shift and be thinking about hearing as not just, oh, well, this is the auditory pathway. Um, the auditory pathway, if you're going to use those words, includes many, many brain systems um, at every single stage of our body and brain and mind. If anyone knows about the brain, it's today's guest, Dr. Nina Krauss. She's a scientist, inventor, and amateur musician who's dedicated her life to studying the biology of auditory learning. And for the Treble Health Podcast, we're excited to welcome her today. Above all else, Dr. Krauss is a highly accomplished neuroscientist. She was one of the first to show a connection between the nervous system of the brain and auditory learning. Through her research, we better understand how sounds impact our neurological and cognitive health. And for better or for worse, sound can damage and sometimes sound can heal. We'll be talking about that in today's podcast episode. Dr. Krauss's work has served as a foundational bridge between neuroscience and audiology, which I personally owe a chunk of my career to. And her influence spans across music, speech processing, language development, uh, some of her studies have changed the way we think about sound and how we hear. One of her biggest accomplishments is creating Brain Vaults, her research laboratory at Northwestern University, and her most recent book, which you should check out, is called Of Sound Mind. One thing is for certain, in my opinion, Dr. Krauss will go down as one of the most prolific auditory neuroscientists of her generation. So with that in mind, Dr. Krauss, I wanted to invite us into the question of if sound can heal, what does that mean for someone with tinnitus? Well, hi there, and thank you for having me on again. Very, very important question, and yes, sound can heal. And I think this is an important point, not strictly for tinnitus, and I think much of what I'm going to talk about, I can foresee, is general principles about the brain and learning and individuals. So... You know, as you, as you mentioned, my book of Sound Mind is my love letter to sound. And I wrote the book and I have this love relationship with sound because sound is a tremendously powerful force in our lives. And it has the potential to heal. It also has the potential to hurt. So for someone with tinnitus, it's like with any other problem that a person might have that might or might not be addressed with sound. This is unwanted sound, and we often don't have too much control over what we can do with the sounds and the ideas and the various things in our heads, but we do have control over the sounds of our lives. And I think that one of the important points that relates to tinnitus, but relates to sound in general, and that I don't think is amply appreciated is the fact that the sound brain is vast, and that the sound brain, you know, and, and when you think about, or the, the hearing brain, the hearing brain is vast, you know, from an audiology perspective, we think of, and I, I think from many perspectives, we think of um, our hearing, our vision, our emotions, we think of these are sort of different systems. But the fact is that the hearing brain is vast. And from a, I'm a biologist. From a biological standpoint, it engages how we feel. It engages how we intersect and connect our other senses. It engages our viscera. It engages what we know, our memory, our abilities to pay attention. It engages um, how we move. You know, sound itself is movement, and producing sound requires movement. Um, so all of these systems, all of these brain systems, are part of the hearing brain. And I think that we need to have a paradigm shift and be thinking about hearing as not just, oh, well, this is the auditory pathway. Um, the auditory pathway, if you're going to use those words, includes many, many brain systems um, at every single stage of our body 
and brain and mind. So I'm going to see if I can address your question a little bit. What about sound and healing? Well, when my youngest grandbaby was born, his name is Otto, uh, and this was a couple months ago, um, he had difficulty breathing. And uh, my son, Otto's dad, held Otto and hummed to him, sang to him. And, and he, he said that the results were instantaneous, that he could just feel his baby relax. And um, Otto was the, in the intensive care unit. And the monitors right next to him told the story in numbers. You could see that his heart rate was stabilizing, his breathing rate was stabilizing, his blood pressure was stabilizing. All of these systems were responding to sound because the hearing brain is so vast and it engages all of these systems. Now, you know, I, I have been taught this. I've read the literature. It turns out that the children in intensive care are really good research subjects because they already are hooked up to various measuring devices. And it has been amply demonstrated that singing is beneficial, is healing to, to, to the entire body. And what is important, and, and I think this sort of will get to some of the questions that you, uh, I think, have up your sleeve, is that it matters what kind of singing and how it is delivered. So if the singer is live, is a person, it has much stronger healing effects than if it's just a recording. If it's a sound from a voice that the baby already knows, and we, you know, we know that the, the hearing brain develops in utero and babies are already learning about uh, the sounds of, of people's voices and the languages that are being spoken, the music that is going on around them. And if the other thing that's important about having this interaction be live is the word interaction, because when you are singing to a baby, you are watching him respond. And uh, it's a back and forth. It's mm. not something, you know, if you're just playing music, that's not going to, it's, it's, it's much less subtle. There's very little context. Uh, you know, if a baby's screaming, that's probably not a great time to just start s trying to sing louder than he's crying. You know, you, you have to respond to the situation. And so I think Absolutely. That, that kind of flexibility is really important for for healing and I think is as relevant to tinnitus as to anything else. I want to tell a story that a few decades ago, there was a researcher called Dr. Pal Jastroboff who created tinnitus retraining therapy. A big component of that treatment modality for tinnitus is sound therapy. So when we talk about sound that can potentially heal or help us, well, tinnitus we know is a neurological condition in most cases. Therefore, it's at, it's innervated, it's connected through the auditory brain, and we're sending certain types of sound into the auditory brain. I want to share with you what I would say are my top tips for sound therapy. Uh, I was a, a student of Dr. Jastroboff. So we want the sound to either be neutral or slightly pleasant. We don't want the sound therapy to be too emotionally engaging like our favorite song, or we don't want the sound to, uh, you know, cause us to have a negative reaction like, oh, I, I can't tolerate white noise. It's just too much for me. So that's number one. Number two, during this tinnitus treatment period, we generally want to have a sound enrichment, meaning not quiet spaces, but having sound around us until we reach a point of what's called habituation, where the brain can reduce the uh, the awareness and sometimes the volume of tinnitus after a treatment period. The third Main point is, generally speaking, we don't want to occlude the ears, so we want to still hear ambient sound around us, and that's really helpful for uh, for habituation, for tinnitus treatment. So what's I want to hear your take on some of those key points related to sound therapy treatment, tinnitus, and more of the auditory processing that goes behind it. Yeah. So uh, what... I think overall, as as general ideas, these are... These, these make a lot of sense, and they, they dovetail well with what we know about uh, learning in general and learning with, through sound. But I think it's very important to be nuanced about 
uh, the sounds I, and to be nuanced about the therapy. Um, people are really, really different. And, uh, you know, the reason that they have tinnitus is different. Um, and we are very, very different with respect to what we have learned over our lives um, that affects how our brain processes sound. So, you know, there may be certain aspects, certain sounds that uh, we engage with more than others. And it isn't even, you know, I think people would love to say, oh, yeah, um, listen to this sound. And this sound might be great for this person this morning, but this same person this afternoon um, might need or benefit from an entirely different sound. So, you know, I would really uh, encourage the idea of, um, of, of, of thinking about what sounds give you the kinds of feelings that you, you know, you've been talking about, uh, which is, um, you know, perhaps something that is calming, but it doesn't even have to be calming. Um, you know, I think it's what is it that the person is wanting at a particular time. Our auditory system is arranged in a way uh, from low to high frequencies repeatedly, like, like little pianos throughout our brain. Um, and this tonotopic organization is an aspect of our sensitivity to the different frequencies of sound. And we know that animals that have been exposed to moderate level meaningless sounds are going to have a blurring of their tonotopic maps. And think about it, especially, this is true for everyone, but especially for the developing brain. Sure. Can I comment for yeah. can I comment for adults, however? So broadband sounds like pink noise, white noise are often the most successful tinnitus treatment sounds. So how do you respond to that fact? That wouldn't be my choice. You know, I, I would uh, be, because let me say something else. Uh, moderate level sounds in general that are noise in our society, this is a real problem. You know, there is constant sound like for example the sound that is, is sort of white noise meaningless sound like the sound of a refrigerator or an air conditioner or the noisy truck outside realize that sound is our alarm sense yes From deep in evolution we have we know that we respond to sound because we, we we need to be able to make the association between a sound and is this something that is going to eat me? Is this something I can eat? Is this something that uh, is I can reproduce with? It's really important to remember these sounds. And they're moderate level sounds. So this is part of our auditory system. They don't have to be loud. Like the it's soft loud. sound of leaves rustling could be a, a deadly snake. It could be. So, so, so think about it. In terms, you know, people are saying these days more than ever, especially if you have tinnitus, I'll bet. People say, I'm stressed, I'm anxious, I have difficulty focusing. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are in a constant low-level state of alarm. So if it were me, I would have sounds that would mask my tinnitus, but they would be sounds like um, a, a natural sound, like the sounds of waves or the sounds of you know, sounds that, that can, in fact, have spectral components that you can delineate and modify, perhaps, according to what it what seems to be best for tinnitus. Yeah, understood. And like you said, each person is different in their preferences. What we find is that some of our patients at Tribal Health, for example, prefer cricket sounds, which are high pitch, uh, amp frequency and amplitude modulating sounds. Uh, because that mixes in with the high pitch nature of their tinnitus in a way that, say, pink noise or white noise doesn't. Other natural water sounds or certain custom high frequency noise can provide a certain level of relief or help for our patients that is different than a steady state noise. So uh, that's interesting. And thank you for explaining that. When we're talking about sound and masking, I wanted to clarify some things that, generally speaking, when someone hears masking, they might think completely covering the tinnitus, but 
the tinnitus treatment process is to some degree desensitization and conditioning. So what's best for conditioning? Repetitions. Therefore, the amount of time that someone has where their brain hears tinnitus, but it's not in a threatened state, it's not perceiving it as a danger or concern, that conditioning over time uh, helps the brain recategorize tinnitus and promote this process called uh, habituation, which is ultimately what modern science has found currently is the best treatment for tinnitus. So that's what we want everyone who's listening to consider. Okay, what is the true root cause of my tinnitus? If it's neurological based, if there's no physical, physiological treatment out there, then what can I do to promote the neurological treatment to promote habituation? So Dr. Krauss, I want to open it to you to share some insights into tinnitus treatment and how really what that means is that our brain is rewiring through this process called neuroplasticity. Uh, what does someone with tinnitus need to know about that? Perhaps knowledge, perhaps encouragement, that there is hope. Curious to hear your thoughts. Well, we, we do know that the hearing brain uh, rewires itself, and it, it also is stable. So it, it both has an ability to change, and it has an ability to be stable, and it will uh, change based on the experience that we have. Uh, we know that a, a, a really a powerful sound or ki- class of sounds that engage many positive benefits is music. And um, and I think that in the fields of audiology, music is often under, oh, it, it's overlooked. I mean, even, you know, m- music is a way of, uh, you know, somebody with normal hearing is a way of strengthening the hearing brain. And yet people often don't think about, well, if I have a hearing loss, maybe I should um, make some sound to meaning connections by um, engaging with making music. Hey guys, quick interruption from today's podcast. If you have tinnitus and are looking for solutions, you feel like you've tried everything, but you still have this bothersome noise in your ears or your head, I'd highly recommend that you consider having a free consultation with a member of my team at Treble Health. We are tinnitus experts and we can take care of you. Check the link on the screen where you can book a free consultation and get started today. Now back to the podcast. So for someone with tinnitus, what advice would you have? What are some actionable things they can do to promote that healthy process there? I would say really think about the music that you like to listen to and think about the music that you would like to have in the background, you know, so it's going to be different for different people. If I, you know, uh, some people find that they focus very well if they have music in the background, other people don't. So, um, you know, I, I would think that finding music, and it's going to be different for not only different people, but different times of day, and also depending on the activity that a person is doing. But, you know, music is varying. It's in it's sound that is changing a lot it's and it's not a mechanical sound um and the if you bathe the brain in sounds that are inherently cool and interesting the brain is going to uh respond is going to be to the sounds that are around them so the healthier the sound the healthier the brain you know my my sense is that in because we our brain does change so much. We are becoming more and more like machines because, you know, we're interacting with machines all the time. You know, the the more we can interact with something that's alive and music is alive, that would be my choice. The brain responds well to that interaction, to that, that human component, to the organic music, to the natural sounds. I love that. I want to pick up on something you mentioned earlier about stress. Sometimes the very thing that can make it so hard to reduce tinnitus is the body being in this fight or flight state, the stressed nervous system, feeling the anxiety, feeling these thoughts that just can't can't get out. And it's no fault of the person who's experiencing it. It's in some ways a natural, you know, subconscious phenomenon where you didn't have control over it, but you might find yourself in that position of automatic negative thoughts, can't fall asleep at night. Uh, anxious, hard time concentrating, and often it's related to the tinnitus, right? So how much of these neurological treatments are related to 
simply settling the mind, settling the body and getting out of the stress state so the body can recalibrate itself. I'm so glad you brought that up and because, you know, I think it's the theme of, of our little talk here is that the hearing brain is vast. The hearing brain very much engages our feelings and it very much engages, um, it, it engages even, even our, our guts, you know, like I don't know if you've ever noticed that, uh, you know, when you're in an airplane, food kind of tastes off. And it turns out that, you know, p people thought that it had to do with the dryness in the air. Turns out that it is the, the scientists have studied this, um, that it's the sound, that it is the sound of these engine whirring. Think of it evolutionarily. Who's hungry when there's an avalanche coming, right? So sound affects our viscera, it affects our um, emotional system, and um, there are few other sounds as calming as some music can be. And you know, people have you know, found that instead of uh, taking pain-killing drugs or instead of you know, taking uh, anti anxiety medication, you know, if, if you can medicate yourself with music, uh, there's, there's good reason, there's good biological reason, but it, it takes time and it's not going to be something that you can just kind of sell and say, oh yeah, just listen to this. It's going to be something that people have to kind of actually become attuned to themselves and their own feelings. Like, oh, you know, when I listen to these, uh, Chopin nocturnes, uh, they, they really calm me down or they really piss me off. You know, you, you kind of figure out what what sounds calm you. And, and, and getting back to this moderate level sounds um, of meaningless sounds, I and mean, think about the fact like right now, you probably can't hear it because the, the, the Zoom connection is, is uh, blocking it. But um, there's 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 a truck outside, and uh, it's it's just making a racket because it's a truck and trucks have engines. And I'm not really paying attention to it; it's really not bothering me. But I know that the minute that it turns off, I will be. I, I'm so relieved. I will just be relieved. And 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 so you know we've all had this experience. So think about it and think about how incredibly sensitive our brain and our emotional system, our entire huge hearing brain, how um, emotionally involved it is when there are sounds of one kind or another. I was once told a story of someone who checks into a motel and this story was told to me by Dr. Jastrobaff, a story where someone checks into a motel and in situation A, they are brought to their room and it's a normal night at the motel and they get settled in for bed. They brush their teeth, they go to the bathroom, they get tucked into bed, they turn the lights off and they were told that there's some mechanical problems going on with the room. So they hear this hissing, they hear this really high pitched hissing sound going on. So they go, oh, it must be some something going on with the room. They call the front desk. They say, yeah, uh, it's it's the radiator pipes. And sorry, they're making this high pitched noise. We have earplugs for you. Or if you want a different room, just let us know. So that's situation A, very informed, very clear understanding of what's going on. Situation B is that they check into the motel. At the front desk at the motel, they explain how there are some animals from the circus that haven't been found, including some snakes. So in this situation, same person goes into the motel room. They go to, they get ready for bed. They go to sleep at night. They turn on, they turn off the lights and they hear this high pitch hissing sound. So their brain is reacting to it, going to the situation of that might be a snake in my bedroom. And then they start freaking out. So it's the same physiological response, but the context, the story behind it and, and the, the fight or flight reaction is so different. Now, what happens for someone with tinnitus? In a good situation, they have a proper evaluation, they get the right information there, and they're directed towards the true root cause and the diagnosis of what's going on. Here's the next steps. 
Situation B, they go to their local doctor and then an ENT specialist who says, hey, there's nothing wrong. The test's pretty much normal. There's nothing we can do for you. Here's a pamphlet. Then they go online, they get reinforced with negative information. This will never go away. There's no cure. And we can see the different stories here with the same base physiological explanation. I think this really demonstrates how so much more than just the auditory sense and everything is you know, related here with the emotional experience, the fight or flight, how the story behind it, what we have. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on, on really how this can give value to someone who is going through difficult tinnitus and perhaps some next steps of, okay, what can I do now knowing this? Yeah. I think that knowledge is empowering and, you know, what we know clearly is, I hope, I've made the point, what we know very much affects how we hear sounds. And, you know, the examples that you gave, I think, illustrate that's, that beautifully. So the more we know about, uh, about tinnitus, about what, you know, we might be able to do uh, to alleviate it, the more we know about ourselves, you know, what seems to help, what seems to make it worse. You know, and having professionals like you um, say, you know, that this is, this is really a thing. And also, you know, to know that, you know, this is something that you can do something about because the hearing brain is so malleable. There are things that, you know, both from our knowledge and from our practices that we can do. We can do it. It's something to keep working at. It's, and it's not going to be a switch. It's going to be, this is why people have relationships with audiologists or with, you know, their hearing health care providers is that you learn, you ask questions, you develop relationships, and uh, you become more aware of just how fabulous the hearing brain is and the different ways. And it's not a static thing. It is something that is alive and malleable as, as, as you are. And um, it's something that can be approached. And I think that the idea also that, well, oh, well, here's, here's a cure. You know, I mean, I think this is, it's more, well, this is something you can try. And if that helps, great. If it doesn't, that's, you know, I mean, someone like you, uh, you know, and you have many, many uh, strategies up your sleeve. And, you know, it's just like when you're, you're trying to repair anything, there are many different ways of um, going about it. And someone who is knowledgeable about it, like you, is someone who is likely to be able to provide many, many different strategies that we know from a biological standpoint, our wonderful, adaptable nervous system can respond to. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Nina Krauss. For those who want to learn more about the hearing brain, how it could relate to their tinnitus and their hearing health, check out the book of Sound Mind. And Dr. Krauss has a ton of amazing research. You can find that at their website. Her lab is called Brain Volts. The website is brainvolts.northwestern.edu. Nina, any final words here for our listeners? Yeah, I, I think that really taking the opportunity to learn about sound and how fabulous it is because it is an underrecognized sense. It is invisible. We are increasingly in a visually biased world and knowing how sound affects our lives, who we are, uh, the world around us will, I think, enable us to make better choices for our own health and for the health of our loved ones. That's what we're here for. Thank you so much, Nina. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Hey guys, thanks for listening to this amazing podcast with Dr. Nina Krause, expert researcher. If you have tinnitus and are looking for help, definitely consider heading over to treblehealth.com. We offer a free consultation where you can speak with a specialist on our team and learn about your options to find a solution to the noise that you hear. We're here to help you, so definitely check it out by clicking the link on the screen where you can get started today. It's free, no obligations. We're really here to do what's best for you and your health. Talk to you soon. Thanks so much.